everybody, welcome back to my channel. Today I'm going to be reading chapter 8 of the Enola Home series. Chapter the 8. I could have pedaled straight into London by the main road, but that would never do. Too many people would see me. No, my plan was my plan for getting to London was simply and I hoped illogically to have no plan if I did if I myself did not know what exactly I was doing. Then how could my brothers guess? My mo they would hypothesize, of course. They would say, Mother took her to Bath, so perhaps she, she has gone there. Or in her room there is a book on whales with pencil markings on the map. Perhaps she has gone there. I hoped they would find the book, which I had placed in the dollhouse as a false clue. The meanings of flowers, however, too large to carry with me, I had hidden among hundreds of other stout volumes in the library downstairs. Mycroft and Sherlock would apply in dis inductive reasoning. Therefore, I reasoned, I must trust to chance. I would let the land show me the way eastward, choosing the stoniest ground or whatever could t show my tire marks the least. It did not matter where I found myself at the end of the day or the next. I would dine upon bread and cheese. I would sleep in the open like a gypsy. Eventually wandering along, I would encounter a railway line. By following it one way or the other, I would find a station. And so long as it was not Charlita, where my brothers would surely choir for me, any station in England would do, for all railways ran to London. So much for a 17-inch waist, oatmeal for breakfast, and wool next to the skin, matrimonial prospects, and accomplishments of a young lady, etc. Such were my happy thoughts as I pedaled across a cow pasture and away from the countryside I knew. In the blue sky overhead, lark sang in my heart as I kept to byways and avoided villages. Not too many people saw me. An occasional farmer looked up from his tur turnip field, unsurprised by the sight of a gentlewoman upon her bicycle. Cycling and enthusiasts had gone increasingly common. Indeed, I just met with another such baize clad figure upon a graveled wagon track, and we nodded in passing. She looked all of glow from the heat and the exercise, horses sweat, you know, and men in proffers were ladies glow. As I am sure I looked all of glow also, I could feel all of a glow trickling down my sides beneath my corset, the steel ribs which jabbed me under the arms most annoyingly. By the time the sun stood overhead, I quite felt ready to stop for lunch on. And more so, I had not slept the night before, seated under a spreading elm tree. Upon cushions of moss, I badly wanted to lie down and pillow my head there for a while. But after I had eaten, I forced myself to get back upon the bicycle and pedal onwards. For I knew I must get away as far as possible before the pursuit began. That afternoon, aptly enough considering my thoughts of gypsies, I met a caravan of the M Norman folk and their brightly painted brown-topped house wagons. Most gentry despised gypsies, but Mother had allowed them to camp sometimes upon the Ferndale estate, and even as a child I had been fascinated by them. I halted my bicycle to watch them pass gazing eagerly upon their many-colored horses, prancing and tossing their heads despite the heat, with the drivers needing to hold them in more urge, in more, then urge them forward. And I waved to the travelers in the wagons without fear, for all the people on earth, gypsies were the li least likely to speak of me to the police. The men darkly ignored me, but some of the bare-headed, bare-necked, bare-armed women waved back, and all of the ragged children waved and squealed and called out, beginning, shameless, dirty, thieving lot, Mrs. Lane would have called them, 
and I suppose she was right. If I had been carrying pennies in the pocket, in my pocket, I would have thrown some to them. Also, that afternoon, on a country road, I met a traveling ped peddler. His wagon hung around tinware and umbrellas and baskets and sea sponges and bird cages and washboards and all manner of trifles. I stopped him and had him show me everything in his stock from copper kettles to tortoise shell combos for the back of the hair in order to disguise my purpose before I bought the, the one thing I really needed, a carpet bag. Laying it across my handlebars, I pedaled on. I saw other wayfarers on foot and conveyances raging from coach and ford to donkey carts, but my memories had become faulty as my weariness blurred by the day. By the time night fell, every part of my person ached, and I felt fagged as never before in my life, walking now upon a turf, cropped to the roots by sheep. Pushing my bicycle and leaning upon it, I struggled up a low limestone studded hill, on top of which I stood a grove of beeches. Once I reached the concealment of the trees, I let my bicycle fall where it would, while I myself collapsed in the dirt and last year's leaves, my spirits low with evening, as they had been high with morning, for I wondered, would I find strength to get on that bicycle tomorrow, unless I could sleep where I was, unless for the first time I thought, what if it rained? My plan not to plan seemed more foolish with every panting breath I drew. After I despi despired for a while, I managed to stagger up and, and in the concealing darkness take off my hat, hairpins, and baggage I carried on my person along, tormenting with my tormenting cor corset too wary even to think of food. I folded to the ground again, and wearing petticoats and my much-soiled taping top suit as my only covering, fell asleep within moments. So nocturnal had my habits become. However, that time, that sometime late at night, I awoke. No longer the least a bit sleepy, I felt famished, but there was no moon tonight. The sky had clouded over. It might indeed rain, and without moonlight or even starlight, I could see not. I could not see to find myself the food I had packed in the box on the bicycle, nor could I see to find the sake of light, the tin matches I had stupidly left in the same place. I would consider myself fortunate if I stumbled upon the bicycle at all. Curses, I muttered naughtily, feeling breech twigs scratch my face and catch my clothing as I launched to my feet. At the next moment, I forgot about food. I stood staring at great distance. I saw lights, gas lamps, glimpsed between trunks of hilltop trees. They twinkled in the distance like earthbound stars, a village. I had come up one side of a hill not knowing and too weary to realize that a village lay on the other side. A town, rather large enough to have gas laid on. A town with perhaps a railway station. And even as I thought it, there came floating my ears. Across the dark of night, a train whistle ten long tenor call. Very, very early the next morning, I stole out of the beech woods. So early, I hoped that if, that few, if any folk would catch sight of me. Not that I was afraid that anyone would recognize me, it was just that I looked a bit odd for a well-dressed widow on foot with a carpet bag to emerge from such primitive lodging. Yes, a window. Head to toe, I wore the black garb of mourning I had taken from my mother's closet, the costume by indicating that I had been married, and added, added a decade or more to my age allowed me to wear my comfortable old black boots, which would not be noticed, and my hair in a simple bun, which I could manage. Best of all, it made me nearly unrecognizable. Hanging from the brim of my black felt hat, a dense brown veil enveloped my entire head so that I looked rather as if I intended to rain a beehive. Black kid leather gloves covered my hands. I made sure of this detail as I lacked a rather a wedding wing, ring and a black 
and a dull black silk covered me from chin to my black toed boots. Ten years ago, mom had been thinner, so her dress fit me nicely with my corset tightened, barely tightened at all. Indeed, no corset would have been necessary if were not to support my improvised baggage in the necessary areas. What I had packed on the bicycle I now carried in the carpet bag or in my pockets. Disliking to detangle a rectual, my mother had provided all her dresses with ample pockets for a handkerchief, lemon drop, shilling, shillings, and pence, etc., etc. Blessings be upon the stubbornly independent head of my mother, who was also the one who had taught me to ride a bicycle. I regretted having to abandon that faithful mechanical steed to the beach woods, but I most certainly did not regret abandoning my ugly ta tape suit. In the gray half-light of daybreak, I st stole downhill along a hedge to a lane, very stiff from yesterday's exer exertions. I realized that my aches and pains were actually a blessing. They forced me to walk slowly, thus at a ladylike gait, in keeping my disguise. I made my way along the lane to a gra graveland road, and so into, town, into the town. Dawn had progressed to a dull sunrise, threatening rain. Shopkeepers were just opening shutters. The ice man was hitching up his his way back to nag to make his round. A yawning maid threw a bucket of something unspeakable into a gutter. A ragged woman swept across, swept a street crossing. Newsboys heaved stacks of the morning editions towards the curb. A match seller sitting at the corner, a beggar really, cried, Let there be light, a match for the gentlemen. Some of those who passed by were indeed gentlemen in top hats, others workmen in flannels and caps, and yet others nearly as ragged as himself. But he cried gentlemen to them all. He made no attempts to sell a match to me, for, of course, for ladies did not smoke. Belvedere tore Ternasium, declared gold letters painted on the glass of a door beside a red and white spiral striped pole. Ah, I have heard of a town called Belvedere, satisfactorily distant from Crimeford. Looking about me, I saw Savings Bank of Belvedere, carved upon the stone, stately building nearby. Very good. I had achieved my goal. Well done, I thought, picking my ways between horse droppings for a mere girl of limited cranial capacity. Onions, potatoes, parsnips, a man called pushing a barrow. Fresh carton in for a gent's buttonhole, cried a shawled woman offering flowers from a basket. Shocking, kidnapping, read all about it, bellowed a newsboy. Kidnapping? Viscout Tuxbury snatched from... Bales Weather Hall. I indeed did. I did indeed want to read all about it, but first I wanted to find the railway station. With this in mind, I followed a top hatted, frock coated, kid gloved gentleman who was positioning a fresh cartons upon his lapel. Formally dressed, perhaps he was going to the city for a long day. Affirming my hypothesis, soon I heard the rumble of an approaching Edmund crescendo to a roar that shook the pavement beneath my boots. Then I could see the packed roof and turrets of the station, with the clock in its tower reading just half past seven, and I could hear the shriek and whine of the brakes as the train pulled in. Whether my unwitting escort traveled to London, I will never know. For as well as we approached the station platform, my attention was taken up by a scene unfolding there. A gawking crowd had gathered. A number of constables formed a line to keep onlookers back. Well, yet more officials in blue uniforms strode f forward to meet the newly arrived train. An engine pulling a single car importantly labeled Police Express. Out of this stepped several men traveling in cloaks. These 
swept the ground impressively enough, but the car flaps of matching cloth caps done up in bows atop their heads looked like little bunny ears. Quite silly, I thought. As I started to edge through the crowd toward the ticket window of the station, as if I had walked into a pot on the boil, all around me bubbled excited voices. It's Scotland's Yard. Right enough, plain class detectives. I heard they sent for Sherlock Holmes, too. Oh my goodness, halting. I eagerly listened, but he won't come. He's called, he's called away by family. The speaker pressed by, confound it. I heard no more of my brother, although babble of a, of a plentency. My cousin's the second assistant upstairs made at the big house. The duchess had gone to clean out of her head, folks say. And she says they, and the duke, and the duke is fit to be tied. Old Pinkering at the back of the bank says they're waiting for a ransom demand. Who'd want the boy if not for ransom? It would seem that Sherlock's that shocking kidnapping had taken place close by. Indeed, watching the detectives pile into quite a lovely landau, I saw them being trotted off towards Green Park, not far beyond the railway station. Above the trees rose gray gothic towers from the talk around me, Belth Whistler Hall. How interesting. But first things first, I must purchase a ticket. However, according to the very large schedule posted upon the station wall, there would be no lack of trains to London every hour or so, all day and into the evening. Duke's son gone missing. Read all about it, shrieked a newsboy standing beneath the schedule. While no believer in Providence, I had to wonder how chance had placed me here on this scene of crime and my brother the great detective somewhere elsewhere my thoughts became unruly and lore ir irresistible abandoning my attempt to reach the ticket window i bought a newspaper instead end of chapter eight